Hello, and welcome to Open World. My name is Greg Pavlik. I'm a Senior Vice President uh, for Oracle's Data Management, AI, and Developer Services on the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. And today I'm going to talk with you a bit about our strategic investments around artificial intelligence um, and how they play into our larger cloud strategy, uh, which is really oriented around the idea that we're providing a, a integrated data platform that includes not just databases, but also big data, data science, and application development, all meant to work together. And we're going to show you how they work together to deliver real world solutions. So we're going to see how we're uh, fundamentally looking to change the game in this space. And so let's dive in. So I have to show a safe harbor because we will be talking about things that are under development um, and will continue to evolve. So this is kind of our mandatory uh, statement of uh, a forward looking direction. Um, and with that, let's get into the presentation. So first thing we want to highlight today is that AI is really becoming a pervasive part of our day to day lives. Okay. Um, whether it's facial recognition within applications or within our phones, um, it's suggestions for your next purchase when you're shopping online, uh, or AI just shaping your overall experience with services from travel to leisure and other online services and capabilities. Simple example of how pervasive AI is, um, one third of all online purchases are made by machine learning driven recommendations according to one of the world's largest online retailers. So AI is quite frequently augmenting our experiences. It's also shaping them in many respects as well. Now, when we talk about shaping them, um, the examples I gave before I think are really positive uh, ways that machine learning is starting to intersect with our day-to-day -day lives, but it's not always that way, right? Every technology has its challenges, and uh, sometimes AI systems fail us uh, in ways in the real world. So facial recognition systems, they've misidentified people. Um, we've seen instances where uh, machine learning models have shown bias in terms of uh, skin color. And in one episode that we thought was pretty interesting to call out, um, a machine learning algorithm identified 28 members, sitting members of US Congress as indicted criminals. Now, <laughs> in case you're wondering, they may or may not have had indictments but the database that contained the information that the model was driven off of um, did not contain any of the members of Congress. So the, the matching there was an error. The models were doing the wrong thing. So similarly, I'd like this middle caption here a little bit. Uh, it, it's a, a model that's supposed to both interpret a uh, image and then provide a human readable description, right? And in this case, um, it misclassifies the image and the grammar that it generates is just kind of gobbledygook. So kind of a failure um, from a modeling perspective. Another interesting uh, example. Last year, uh, the World Cup, um, there were 18 attempts to identify and predict winners within the, cup, uh, within the World Cup. And it included universities in Belgium, Germany, Russia. There were uh, UBS, the Swiss bank, uh, Goldman Sachs, um, and at least um, one Silicon Valley startup. The only uh, successful prediction was the game maker Electronic Arts. So that was the only success. Collectively, um, these attempts to make the World Cup predictions were outshone by Paul the Octopus. Um, so he had a 100% success rate at predicting uh, the outcome for the 2010 World Cup and his overall lifetime success rate was 85%. And the way that Paul the octopus worked um, is that they would put two box baskets with food in them, two containers with food, and um, the playing team's country flags would be on each of the containers. So the octopus would uh, open up one of the containers, eat the food, and that would be selected as the winners. And like I say, his, his track record was phenomenal. Um, and uh, at first, when uh, I think it was Argentina uh, versus Germany, um, Argentina was predicted to lose, and so they started to tweet and put out um, recipes for octopuses. Um, Paul came out on top in this case. In the next round, I think it was Germany versus Spain. Um, he predicted Spain, and of course the Germans then uh, proceeded to um, start to put, publish their own recipes for octopus. Um, and it was at a point where 
the Spanish Prime Minister actually offered to send a security detail for Paul to protect him. Um, and Spain did indeed win. So um, unfortunately, this kind of octopus only lives for about two years. Um, so his predictive uh, career is over. Um, but, but the key thing here is uh, AI is highly in demand. Why is that? I mean, the, the investment for AI is skyrocketing. The prioritization is skyrocketing. It's because when you do have the right data, um, when you have the right platform to build effective models, and you have the right targeted use cases, companies are seeing real value. And we're seeing it over and over again. We see this one recent survey showed that 61% uh, of organizations have flagged artificial intelligence initiatives as their top uh, or their number one most important corporate initiative in the coming years. And um, those surveys are showing those results for a reason, right? So um, IDC, I believe, predicts that upwards of six, or McKinsey, rather, predicts upwards of $6 trillion in value unlocked by AI solutions in, in the coming years. So here's some examples. I think it's kind of interesting. Oracle customers that we've been working with who have been using machine learning and getting really uh, compelling outcomes from their initiative. So one is Kaisha Bank. So Kaisha Bank is one of Oracle's first big data customers. Um, they have many AI-driven use cases, optimizing their experience over their 14 million uh, cu customer or user base, optimizing pricing for offers, and then also just targeted offers in general, where they're looking at the propensity to buy been very successful for them as a company. DX Marketing is a uh, Georgia-based startup. They've done, I think they're, they're in uh, Savannah, Georgia. They do uh, marketing spend optimization. So there's a saying in marketing that 50% um, of the marketing spend is wasted, but nobody can tell you what 50% is the part that's wasted. So there's a sort of ambiguity in the effectiveness of the marketing uh, spend overall. And uh, DX Marketing is really um, using machine learning to help companies optimize their targeted marketing um, campaigns. And then finally, um, the National Health Service for the UK. They're using AI in a way that's driving about 700 million uh, in pound sterling savings on a year-over-year -year basis. And they're looking at fraud, they're looking at patient outcome optimizations, et cetera but they're applying artificial intelligence across a range of problems, which are kind of near and dear, I think, to the heart of everyone. <clears throat> so with that, I think just kind of uh, deepen and give you a little bit more of an example of a real world use case. Let's take a look at uh, Avatar. Avatar is a company that's working with Oracle focused on the wellness industry. They're optim they're, they're, they have a specialty application that is focused on online safety for children. So let's hear from their CEO, Zach Landry. Avatar is an AI platform that empowers parents and guardians to protect their children from the real world dangers of their digital lives. Our strategy is to partner with Molecular and Oracle Cloud to bring this solution to all parents and guardians. We help foster safer kids and healthier families through a movement empowered by data and AI. So this is kind of, this is a really interesting uh, use case, and we'll look at it in more depth later. But, um, you know, almost everybody's on social media in some form, including children, and uh, they're not without risk. So this idea of using machine learning models, using artificial intelligence to help children stay safe online, very appealing to parents, to government regulators, uh, to law enforcement. And so we're excited to be working with Avatar and their partner, Molecula, um, to help drive this kind of um, solution. <clears throat> so I think the big question really isn't, is, a, is, not, is AI valuable? It's really, um, how do you get started getting value? What are the building blocks that are needed to build quality machine learning models? And how do they come together to form a real world solution? So let's talk a bit about how Oracle's thinking about this problem. So first, there are several essential building blocks for an AI solution. Most people, I think, when they um, start to consider the problem of getting started with machine learning, they're worried mostly about the middle building block, right? This is the machine learning platform that helps you generate the models. 
And you need this, of course, right? You need to be able to build models. You need to be able to train models. You need to be able to manage the models after they go into production so that you're driving predictions and recommendations that are correct, right? The predictive efficacy of the model needs to be effective. But what many people forget is the data, right? The models are derived from data. And so the first and most fundamental problem for every AI project is figuring out how you capture and manage the data at scale. And sometimes it can be many petabytes of data, right? So there's large data capture problems. Sometimes it's streaming data um, coming off of sensors or other devices. Typically, these represent non-trivial sets of challenges. And then once you've built the model, you got the data and you build the model, how do you operationalize it? And operationalizing is it isn't just making the model available in some way, shape, or form, but it needs to be able to be updated. It needs to be able to evolve as the data changes so that the model continues to offer correct predictions, okay? So these are the three buckets of requirements that we really focused on. And as we go through the talk today, we're gonna give you specific examples of how you solve eat the problem at each stage uh, of the AI lifecycle. So this is what we consider to be driving the main characteristics of the AI pipeline. This is what we'll be showing you today, okay? So we believe that when having a set of piece parts here doesn't really work. That what users need is an end-to-end -end solution that's integrated, works well together, and covers the entire life cycle uh, for a machine learning model and for data management. So first on the data management side, we need a platform that captures streaming data and batch data into a data lake. This makes the right data available to the data scientist. Now, once that data is available for the data scientist, the data scientist has to have a machine learning platform that covers the full life cycle of the model. You have to be able to operate or execute over that data at scale, train models using the most effective compute infrastructure, right? Oftentimes, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, people start out with CPUs, they immediately start to learn and realize that GPUs are much more efficient. Right, so having that available, and it needs to be available in a high performance and low latency environment. And then finally, as we move to a solution, and to the complete solution, you need to be able to deploy the models and make them available for applications and for analytic reporting so that they're consumable by the organization. And that involves um, not just the deployment of the model, the maintenance of the model, security, governance. So we'll show you how we recommend doing that in our overall solution architecture. So let's start with data management. So how do we, as Oracle, help you get to the right data? So first, let's talk about the data challenges for AI. This quote from IDC really, I think for me, drives home the issue. 80% of the time in AI projects is dedicated to getting the right data. Right, so you know, most people, again, they start thinking about the models, they start thinking about modeling, they start thinking about data science tools, they're all critical, right? But 80% of the effort is getting the right data, getting the data into the right shape, and making it available for the data scientists. And unless you have this, um, the overall data science platform isn't useful. So when we talk about acquiring the right data, when we look at the problem domain, there are a number of key things that need to be brought together to get the right data. So data ingestion has to be available to hook up to many different sources. You need data preparation. You need to be able to massage and transform the data. You need to be able to cleanse the data and get it into a format that the data scientists can use. All this has to be done in a way that's secure, it's traceable, it's put under overarching corporate governance to protect uh, data privacy and protect the organization's data and make sure it's being used in the right way, okay? So we have a complete solution. This is what we call the Oracle Cloud Data Management Platform. And obviously, we need to offer you structured data management solutions, which we do, the Oracle Autonomous Database, um, which you'll hear a lot about here at Open World, is a key part of the solution, but it's not the complete solution. Right? In order to deal with these kinds of data sets and the typical problems that data scientists are addressing, you also need to be able to deal with unstructured data and data at scale. So we have Apache Spark-based solution that we'll be demoing in part today, and also an Apache Hadoop solution for managing big data and unstructured data sets. 
Underpinning this is a key set of supporting capabilities. We've got a Kafka-compatible streaming service. We'll show you an example of that as well. A data integration service to transform your data sets and prepare your data for the data scientists. And also database migration capabilities to move entire databases into the cloud. All these data assets can be tracked and managed with the OCI data catalog service. So we have a way to bring this all together, move it into the cloud, and be able to track and manage the data assets through their entire life cycle. So our goal is to provide a pre-integrated solution for all your data management needs, structured or unstructured, right out of the box in the cloud. OK, so let's see this in action. I would like to invite up Carter Shanklin. So he's the senior director in our development organization. Thanks, Welcome, Carter. And uh, he's going to show us how OCI enables us to load data into a data lake. So Carter, thanks for being here. What are you going to show us? Thanks, Greg. Thanks, everybody, for coming. So we're all very excited to see how AI is changing our lives. But we're here today to really understand more about how the Oracle Cloud is helping power this transformation. To do that, what we're going to do is we're going to show a complete end-to-end -end machine learning uh, pipeline that allows us to detect whether a patient, a medical patient, has pneumonia based on an x-ray image of their chest. Pneumonia is a disease that affects more than 1 million Americans every year and contributes to about 50,000 deaths every year, making it a top 10 uh, leading cause of death. At the same time, the U.S. is estimated to have a shortage of more than 100,000 physicians by the year 2030. So what we see here is we need technology and artificial intelligence to really help bridge this gap. And artificial intelligence will help us because it accelerates that diagnosis process and makes us less dependent upon those very, very hard to find specialists. So let's see how this works. So I'm here in the Oracle Cloud. And what we want to do is we're going to, we're going to do, uh, double click and drill in on that first part of the data uh, overall end-to-end -end pipeline process, the data gathering. So uh, machine learning algorithms require a lot of data to be successful. And the easiest way to get data into the Oracle Cloud is using the streaming service. I've created a stream here. And what we see is these medical images are streaming in from a cons on a constant basis from medical providers all around the country. The challenge comes when we look at how this data is stored within our data lake. The streaming service stores its data as a text backup format. This is not going to make any sense to a data scientist. And this really illustrates the key problem facing machine learning professionals today. They spend more than 80% of their time just getting to the right data, getting it properly prepared and into the right structure, rather than doing their real work. We need tools that are going to make it easier to collect the right data and make that available, searchable, and standardized for our data scientists to make them more productive. So to start out with, I am going to standardize that text data that won't make sense. I'm going to standardize that into an image format. I'm going to do that using a tool called Dataflow. Dataflow is a fully managed Spark service that lets me run any Apache Spark application without any management overhead. I've created an application here called ETL Medical Images, and I've run it. And what we see when we look at the logs of this is we've taken about 1,000 images out of that text format, and we've converted them into images that will make sense to a data scientist. Let's take a look at some of those. Now, when we look at the uh, results of this transformation process, we see that we have images rather than text. This is something that a data scientist can feed into their machine learning algorithms. So great, we're ready for machine learning, except there's one more problem. How is a data scientist supposed to find this data that we've created for them? Now, that problem is solved by the Oracle Catalog. Think of the Oracle Catalog as a search engine for your data lake. It crawls, it indexes, and it makes it searchable. I've added my data lake here as a, as a connection within the catalog. So I select that, I go in, I harvest. The harvest process indexes the data within the lake. 
I will uh, select the location where I know that these uh, converted images reside, give my job a name, run that, and I run my harvesting process. So at the end of that, we have, we've indexed that data, we've made it available and searchable to everyone. Now any data scientist can come up here and search the catalog, just like using a Google search, and locate the data that they need to, uh, to feed into their machine learning algorithms. So to summarize it, we've seen that we have tools to make it easy to ingest, to standardize, and to index the data. We've do, we solved the first set of problems in that overall machine learning life cycle. Thank you, Greg. All right. Thank you, Carter. Excellent. So I think that's, uh, this is a very cool example, and it really helps to illustrate why an integrated data platform is a key part of an overall AI pipeline. Um, this example is particularly powerful because it takes uh, unstructured data, it's able to transform it effectively, it's able to make it discoverable and available to data scientists, very simply using a, a set of tools that are built in services, native services to Oracle Cloud infrastructure. So we got the data in, right? The data is available. But let's talk a bit about machine learning itself. What you want out the other side of the availability of these uh, images is a model that will make predictions. Does our patient have pneumonia or not, right? So we need to get the right model. So the question is, how do we get there? First thing I wanted to step back and, and point out is that for machine learning projects in general, uh, more and more organizations are looking to get AI and advanced analytics as a service. There are a lot of different technologies that data scientists use, um, libraries, languages, tools, notebooks, et cetera. Um, it's a really hard problem to assemble these, get them all to work together in a way um, that's reproducible, that's well understood, especially if data scientists are off um, working on a collection that they've assembled themselves on their laptops, okay? So, you know, if a data scientist is off working with a bunch of evolving open source algorithms and toolkits, we need to figure out how we corral that, how we bring it all together into a platform available as a service. So by a large margin, about 2.6 times, according to a Deloitte study that was just published, enterprises want their AI platform to be available as a cloud service. So we're gonna be talking about our data science cloud service today. When you look at the problem domain, there are a number of requirements that need to be met, right? The machine learning tool needs to be able to explore and discover data that is relevant to the model, right? That needs to be built into the environment. In our case, we also bridge into the catalog we showed. Data scientists, they need to be able to manipulate the data. Once they get the data in a form that's usable, they need to be able to make sense of it. Right? They need to understand it, they need to be able to explore it, and they need to make it available in a, a form that's effective for the particular kinds of algorithms that they're gonna apply to develop models. This is called feature engineering, right? a fundamental part of the data science lifecycle. And then once the data is understood and ready to use, they wanna try multiple approaches, and they wanna train many models. They wanna see what models are most effective, where do they get the best predictions, how accurate are the predictions overall across a class of different models. So they need access to a lot of compute machinery on demand, and frankly, they only wanna pay for what they're using at the time. Um, lastly, they wanna understand why the models are making the predictions they're making, right? They wanna be able to explain the decision that the model is actually generating. This is incredibly important for regulated industries, but I think it's useful for any enterprise or important for any enterprise, frankly. So Oracle provides a complete cloud data science solution as a part of the Oracle cloud infrastructure. It's built on top of the high performance and low latency uh, compute and networking infrastructure that we provide as a part of OCI. And it adds in capabilities for model training, for model deployment, and also for ongoing model management, meaning making sure that the models remain effective after they're published, even as data sets start to change over time. So with this environment, a data scientist has capabilities that they can, all these capabilities are available and accessible within a managed Jupyter notebook. We mean managed because it's an environment that can be set up 
by the team leads to have the libraries and tools available that the team needs, but they're there in a traceable way. And they're also tied into source code control systems, et cetera, so that um, the, the work that the data scientist is doing within the notebook can be shared amongst a team. It's, it's, it's there, it's archived, it's shareable, it's discoverable. So typically the data scientists will work in this notebook environment. Um, they'll use a language like Python and uh, they'll be working collaboratively with other peers in their organization. And then finally, the data scientist um, needs to be able to get the value out of the data efficiently. We have something we call the advanced, um, accelerated rather, data science toolkit, which is built into the platform and we'll be looking at how data scientists can leverage that today to accelerate their delivery of models as they build the models, as they train the models, as they evaluate the models, and as they try to explain the models. So that's a key part of the value proposition of the service. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite you to see us in action and have J.R. Gautier, our lead data scientist, come up and uh, show us this platform in action. Thanks, J.R., what are you gonna show us here? Thank you. So I'm going to show you how you can train a deep learning model to detect pneumonia in those x-ray images. All right. Let's get started. So we're going to go back to the console here, and we're going to access the data science service. And the first page you're going to see here is the projects page. So you can think of a project as a collaborative workspace where a team of data scientists would work to solve a particular business problem. So in this case, it would be medical diagnosis. And so they can build, train, manage, and deploy their machine learning models in that project. So let me click on the medical diagnosis with deep learning project here. As a data scientist, I can take a couple of actions in a, in a project. I can create a notebook session, or I can also create and save a model. I have already have a notebook session running here called X-ray Imaging Model, so we're going to go into the notebook session. All right, so a notebook session is an interactive development environment for data scientists to code in Python. This is the familiar JupyterLab environment. And not only do we provide JupyterLab as part of the notebook session resource, we also include a whole bunch of machine learning libraries. So your Keras, your TensorFlow, your Scikit-Learn, all the classics are included in there. And as you mentioned, Greg, we also included the accelerated data science uh, library that includes a whole bunch of tools to make your data scientists more productive and also some unique Oracle IP around automated machine learning and model explanation. So I've already created a notebook here, so I'm gonna open it for you. And so I'm gonna walk you through the process of training that deep learning model. First, as a data scientist, I need to import all the libraries that I need to do my work. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull those X-ray images from object storage. So all of those are clean X-ray data that uh, Carter created for me. So I'm gonna use ADS here not just to pull that data, but also to create a data frame uh, that will contain all the metadata about those images. Things like axis ratio, the number of pixels in those images, the extension, all of that. And with one line of code in ADS, I can profile the data. So here I get a nice summary of my data frame. I get for every single column in my data set, I get a distribution over the values, I get summary statistics. All of these things are very important to data scientists. Here they would have to spend hundreds of lines of code to achieve the same goal. In ADS, you only need one line of code. You also get a sample of the data. So the next step in the process is to do what's called exploratory data analysis. So this is a standard step that data scientists will go through where they're gonna plot a whole bunch of columns in the data set and try to understand the content of the data. So I'm gonna do that here, but I'm gonna quickly go through that and then jump and show you what these X-ray images look like. So this is just a sample of about eight of those. So there's 5,000 images in the sample. Uh, so they are focused on the uh, chest area here. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do some data transformation, but I'm gonna skip that here. and just gonna jump directly into the model training portion. So I'm gonna train a CNN model, a convolutional neural network with Keras, which is an open source library. And so it's a simple model, only has two convolutional layers, but it does a pretty good job as you will see later. So for those of you familiar with Keras, I need to define my model. This is a sequential model. I'm gonna do that here. And then let's go into the training portion here. So I trained the model already. It takes a few minutes to do that. 
once I've trained the model, the next step in the process is to evaluate that model, is to understand how good is that model on the data set that is, hasn't seen yet, it hasn't been trained on. So I'm going to use the ADS Evaluator API and pass it a test data set to better understand how my model is performing. So with one line of code in ADS, I can generate all the standard diagnostics that you expect for a binary classification problem. So an ROC curve, lift chart, gain charts, all of those are standard diagnostics that your data scientists want to see. Again here, one line of code. And you can also look at the metrics for that particular model. So I see here that I have an accuracy of about 90%, which is not bad, given that the data set is fairly balanced. So now, after I've gone through this entire process of train, building, training, and evaluating my model, the last step here is to save it. So I'm going to use the ADS model API to create a model artifact, which is a binary representation of my model. It also includes a few supporting files to reproduce that model later on. So I'm going to use that, create the artifact here, and then I'm going to save the model to the model catalog. So that's the last step. And to show you that, I'm going to go back into UI here under the medical diagnosis project under the models resource, and here you go. The model is right here. Once the model is in the model catalog, it becomes available to any data scientist who's working in this project. So another data scientist could load that model in their notebook. They could compare it with a model candidate that they're working on. They could also use it to score data in a batch mode, for example. But that's not what I'm going to do here. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to de deploy my model as a REST API endpoint. That's what I want to do. I want my model to be consumed by some external application. And in order for me to do that, I'm going to download that model artifact on my laptop just to show you what it looks like. Here's your model object and some supporting files here to reproduce that model. So I'm going to, uh, what I did in the past is I downloaded that model locally and I built a Docker image. And I pushed that Docker image to the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Image Registry. And from there, we're going to use Oracle Functions to deploy that model as a REST API endpoint. So that's it. So we've gone through the process of building, training, and saving our model in the data science service. All right, so uh, back to you, Greg. Okay. Thanks, JR. That was great. So I think this is, this, is a, this is really cool. So first of all, you can see how easy it is to take advantage of the data sets that we made available, right? We were able to simply get that data in, make it available in a format that was useful for the data scientists. Data scientists in their managed environment was able to use the tools and languages they're familiar with, but um, go in, take advantage of the, the data sets simply and use it to generate a fairly powerful model. Very quickly, very easily, once the model's built, save it, make it available for other data scientists, and also package it up in a Docker container that's now available in an image registry so that others can consume it and deploy it within application context, right? So a lot was happening there, and along the way, what made it fast, what made it efficient, was this accelerated data science toolkit, which is built into the platform. Um, so there's a lot to see there, but it, uh, it really illustrates how effective and how fast you can get real work done in this platform on OCI. So let's talk a little bit about now where we move after this, right? So let's talk about deployment and operations. We have the right data in. JR was able to build us a, the right model. And so now we want to get this into production and be able to use it within the enterprise, right? So that's really what we're after here. So turns out it's a major challenge for a lot of organizations to get models into production, right? Lots of times when you're not working on a managed environment, data scientists are building things on their laptops. Um, they're not easily reproducible, they're hard to export. Many times um, the data scientist will hand over the model description to a developer who will try and re-implement it, which is kind of error prone um, and sort of a high, high turnaround process. So in a lot of enterprises, this is a key problem. Yet at the same time, everyone's trying to move forward with AI solutions, right? So we want to show you how easy it is when you're working in this environment to get a solution into production. Most of the AI solutions on the market, in our opinion, really haven't thought this problem through very well, right? How do you actually operationalize your model? It is not just about deploying the model, or it's not just about saying, hey, we can make this thing available in some way, shape, or form, 
right? We have to be able to secure it. We have to make sure only the right people can get access to it. We have to be able to service it in the right places, whether it's within custom applications or analytic reports. And then we need to be able to monitor the models and determine if there's degradation in their predictions, in their predictive capabilities, right? And if so, it has to be very easy, very efficient to rebuild, retrain the model, and republish it so that the data changes are being supported by the correct model over time, not just at a point in time, right? So these are all key requirements for a predictive uh, model within an effective AI pipeline solution. So Oracle is providing a very modern cloud application platform, which is the basis for how we're gonna show you uh, a path to take your models into production effectively. How you can publish them, how you consume them, how you can use them in real time, okay? So what we have here is a really simple take on publication and oper operationalization of a machine learning model, just like the one JR showed you. And we're gonna deploy it into our serverless functions engine, right? Which is a um, very simple environment for taking a containerized deployment and making it available for on-demand usage in the OCI environment. And then once it ava it's available, we're gonna, use, we're gonna expose it to users through our API gateway. This is a complete serverless solution, trending towards zero operational overhead for the enterprise, okay, for taking your model and getting it into production. And then it can be consumed from multiple delivery channels. Anything that can consume an API can consume this model. So let's see this now in action. I'm gonna invite up Sean Smith, who's part of our development org, focused on our functions and our API gateway environment. Hey, Sean. So why don't you come up and show us how we get this model into production. All right, I will do that. Let me just switch over to me. All right. There we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, so we're gonna, I'm gonna pick up where JR left off and, uh, and take his container and deploy it as a Oracle function, as we said, and that'll allow us to call it on demand, it'll scale automatically, it really is a nice way to package and deploy functionality. So let me just go into the console here. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check up on JR, make sure he did uh, provide me the container. So I'm gonna go down to the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure Registry here, and I'm gonna find, yeah, there's his repository, so the X-ray diagnostic uh, container that contains his model a container image, and he's got version six, so there's just one version there. So what I'll do now is I'm gonna go over to the Oracle Functions console and build a function from that container. So go to Functions. Now, I see a list of applications, and in the Oracle Functions, applications are just collections of functions, and we, we do that, we group them together so we can apply some common configuration. So it's sort of a convenience in some way. So first job is to create an application to contain my function or functions. Uh, Step one, a descriptive name is required, so I'll call it X-Ray Diagnostics. And I'm gonna connect, uh, configure a network here for these functions to talk on, and I will skip logging. Okay, so it's a demo, so I won't go into the logs today. So I've created an application, that's sort of a you know, required step, but let's go and actually work on the functions. So here's a list of functions I have, and of course nothing right now. Um, I could be, and most, most developers will be working on the command line, so a lot of CLI tools for doing work, but I have a way of uh, actually building a function from a container here in the console. So create a function, and I get a dialog uh, for my function. Again, I'll give it a descriptive name. I'll call it diagnose function, where I'm gonna diagnose x-ray images. And now I can reach over into the repository here and browse and find that container that JR published. So there's the x-ray diagnostic repository, and there's only one version, so it's defaulted correctly. Now these models may uh, use a fair bit of RAM, so I'm gonna configure this function so when it runs, this container runs, I'm gonna give it uh, about a gigabyte of RAM here, and it might run for a little bit more than the default 30 seconds, depending on the complexity, so I'll bump that up also to 120 seconds. And that's really all I have to do. So I actually have, at this point, have taken the, that, that container image, and now I've made it runnable on demand, and, and we'll spin up as many instances as we need to handle the workload. So it's a nice, nice uh, packaging mechanism the, in functions. But now I do want to expose it. So we talked about operationalizing it, so deploying it, managing it. I'm gonna do that through the API gateway. So I'm just gonna click on this function and say publish API. So I'm gonna expose it as an HTTP API. 
Now this is the, uh, the OPI, the, sorry, the OPI, the ACE OCI API gateway, too many vowels. Uh, and this is the, uh, where I can create a gateway. So I can either add this function to an existing gateway or create a new gateway for this function. And I'm gonna go with new because it'll let you see a bit more of the, the details. So once again, a descriptive name is, is usually a good thing, so I'll call that the X-ray gateway. Now, we do wanna make this function, this API public for consumption in, say, mobile clients. So I will change that type to public. And networking will default fine for me. And I'm gonna give it a host name uh, that's useful. I'm gonna expose this function on clinicaltrials.oracle.com. And the last thing I have to do is actually name the, the gateway, or the API itself, and we'll call that the uh, X-ray gateway. Our API, and I'm gonna expose the function at the path diagnose. So simply hitting deploy, and I have an instance of a gateway now where that function is now deployed. Now, the, this, it's not just a matter of exposing this, this function as, a, as an API, it's actually the, the really important pieces that the gateway gives us, which is um, I can uh, implement, I can uh, specify the auth I want to use so I can secure it. So I, of course, made a public API, but I don't want everyone to call that API, just the authorized uh, individuals or, or applications. Uh, we also get things like rate limiting, we get uh, denial of service uh, detection. Uh, so those kinds of things come with the gateway automatically. So we've taken basically this, this journey from ingesting a large amount of data, we've built a model, we've packaged it as a container, I've deployed it as a function, and then I've basically operationalized it. I've moved it into the, behind the gateway, I can call it, I can secure it, manage it, monitor it. So we've really gone the full, the full cycle from, from fin finish to, to production. Okay, excellent. Yes. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, so something that might not have been apparent at the start, but hopefully is clear by now, is that everything we showed you is running on Oracle Cloud infrastructure. This is our second generation cloud that we've been building out since 2015, and it's now available in 12 different regions around the world. So let me drill down on this a little bit because running a data science team building machine learning models is extraordinarily compute intensive and having the right underlying infrastructure is absolutely key to the success for an organization. So when we started out in 2015 with OCI, we had several goals in mind. We didn't think that most clouds were actually built for enterprise workloads, databases, AI and machine learning, overall data management, and then cloud native applications. They were all key design centers that were really driving the way we thought about the overarching cloud solution. So capabilities like bare metal compute, high performance networking, the ability to support HPC workloads, these were all built into the design from the ground up. And then rounding it off, it's been our longtime view that out of the gate, security and control of the infrastructure at, as an enterprise is just a critical requirement. So OCI, this is what it looks like in the large, okay? It's a complete environment with regions around the world. It's a rich set of core services, right? That allow you to do compute, allow you to do networking across bare metal instances, virtual machines, and containers, we've got built-in security, there's a range of storage options. It's a complete cloud infrastructure offering built for the enterprise. The data services, the AI services that you're seeing today are all built on top of that foundation and are some of our newest additions. So to help you give a little, to help, to help you get a little more understanding on OCI and its importance for machine learning and data science, I wanted to bring up H.O. Maycott, CEO of Molecula. Thanks, Greg. Molecula was a key driver for the avatar solution that you saw the video on earlier. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit. What do you do at Molecula, and how do you help customers get value from AI? Well, as we heard today, we very much believe that AI is all about the data. So our goal is to help enterprises get access to 100% of the data when and where they need it. And what Molecula does differently is it does this without making copies of your data. Today, there's eight copies of your data between data and decision. And when you can do it without making copies, it's a lot cheaper, obviously, it's a lot more performant, and more importantly, it's way more secure. So, okay, so tell us a little bit about how you helped Avatar. How yep. did that solution come together? So Avatar really wanted to move their AI workloads to the cloud. 
the problem like many companies face today is they have massive data sets that are sitting behind the firewall in on-prem environments. These data sets are incredibly sensitive in terms of the nature of the data, especially when you're dealing with kids and parents. So it was not an option for them to copy this data to the cloud to be able to do their workloads on it. So Molecula creates these representations, and we move these representations to the cloud, and these rep re representations are queryable. You can train models against them, and you can put those models into production. So it is a, a much better way of doing things. And Avatar is not the only one in the world that faces regulatory issues. So FERPA, HIPAA, GDPR, yeah. it's affecting everyone. So getting to the cloud is a huge challenge because of security issues. So okay, so I think we can appreciate where some of these data privacy and limitations on data movement come from, but why is it important to use the cloud for doing AI workloads? Yeah, great question. Well, AI workloads, advanced analytics workloads, sometimes they need huge amounts of compute. But between training and running models in production, sometimes you need very small amounts of compute. If you're doing this on-prem, you have to be over-provisioned the entire time in order to be able to manage that variability. So the cloud lets you use exactly what you need when you need it. Okay, okay, and uh, all this was done on OCI. What made you choose OCI? What was compelling about Oracle's cloud infrastructure offering? Great, I love this question. When we first started using OCI, we started to notice that everything was performing a little bit better. We really had a hard time believing it, so we did about a 1,500 point benchmark and found that OCI was far more performant than the other clouds, so that was number one. Number two is we then wondered, well, is it gonna be more expensive? So we did a really detailed three-year TCO and we found that it was about 50% less than all of the other clouds. And then the third, which is if you really dive into the T's and C's and into the SLA's, these really mission critical workloads should not be on any other cloud. They need to be on Oracle. And then services, you know, take those three reasons and, and, and focus on what you need to do your job. So access to cloud native tools um, was really important to us. Um, we love tools like Fast Connect. So when we move these representations, it's just like any other Oracle cloud service. So, in conclusion, we love that it was uh, you know, far more performant. That was most important. It turned out to be more cost effective, and it gave us peace of mind to move these clients to Oracle. All right, all right, that's great. Thank you, HO. Yes, my pleasure. Yeah. All right. So great example of real world success story around applying AI in a critical area, right? Where Avatar and Molecular really put together a unique uh, solution that I think everybody can appreciate from a, uh, kind of the way it touches our immediate lives. So great, thank you very much, HO. So let me give you a few takeaways, just a, as a wrap up here. Um, one is just, Oracle's been in the data management business for 40 years. And we've helped the largest companies build solutions securely at enterprise scale over that time. We've been doing artificial intelligence work since the internet within the database, within data sets that are managed with Oracle. And so for us, this move into the cloud and to broaden the problem into multi-structured data sets is just a natural evolution for where the company has been going since its origins, right? So we're very proud of what we've done with OCI. We're very proud of what we've shown you today around data management overall, the ability to use a high power uh, data science environment over top of the OCI compute networking infrastructure and the ability to easily take these workloads and get them into production for real world users. The AI platform that we showed um, really is shining with analysts and the evaluation. We're thinking about this problem end to end, as you know, right? We look at it as delivering an AI pipeline. As you can see from the Forrester waves here, we've been delivering on each of those individual building blocks, best of breed services, for enabling data lakes, for data integration, for data warehousing, for data science, for analytics and application development, right? So we're making these investments to work together, but we're going deep in each of these areas to offer you an integrated end-to-end -end and complete platform for AI applications. Finally, what we showed you today, you can try tonight and throughout the week here at Open World. We've got sessions that cover all these services throughout the week. Um, we've got hands-on labs and demo stations so you can actually use these services, explore them, and uh, get a sense for yourselves 
of how easy it is to use these technologies to solve complex enterprise scale problems. So all this week we'll be drilling down on this, plenty of opportunity to see it, and I really want to encourage everyone um, to roll up their sleeves and get their hands dirty. Use the technology and see for yourself. And last year, thank you very much and have a great open world.